<laughs> I think I broke Unlike Uncle play. Banzai, we don't have to pay for this by the inch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a live recording of them. Here we go. Now, we've got one of the best episodes in the entire book today. It's also what I consider one of the three hardest. The three toughest episodes in this book are, in order of difficulty, my opinion, Circe, Oxen of the Sun, and this one. Uh, Cyclops. So this is one of the more difficult episodes. I'm gonna try to get this done in under a half hour so that my upload isn't huge and uh, you know wish me well. I need your support on this one. It's a toughie. All right so let's start with what happens in the Odyssey so that we have a reference point. So in the Odyssey, and this is one of the more complicated, usually I can synopsize these in like 30 seconds. This one is a little more complex, so we've got a bit of a story to tell here. So in the Odyssey, Odysseus takes his crew to this island of the Cyclopeans. Now, he wants to go there and see if the inhabitants are hospitable. So he takes his crew and some of his best wine, and he's going to, of course, to give the wine his gifts, and he wants to find out the, the hospitality of the Cyclopeans. He knows nothing about them. The island is inhabited by giants, big guys. They find the cave of one of these giants, Polyphemus, who is a, a one-eyed Cyclopean probably where we get the term Cyclops, okay? He is not around, uh, Polyphemus is not there, so the guys go in and they see this big cheese block and they decide, well, let's have some cheese, so they help themselves to some cheese and Polyphemus shows up and Odysseus says, um, you know, we're travelers and do we have some wine with us, and uh, we'd like to see if you're hospitable. And uh, by the way, we had some cheese, and we'd like to dine with you and, uh, and get to know you. And Polyphemus looks down at these small guys, picks up two of them, throws them on a cutting board, <coughs> chops them up, and eats them. Just like that, two guys, psh, gone. So obviously they're not that hospitable. And uh, this causes a bit of panic with Odysseus and the remaining crew members, as likely it would. And then Polyphemus, uh, they, they go for the door, and he blocks the door with a boulder. So he rolls this big rock in front of the cave so that the guys can't get out. Now they're trapped in this giant cave with this giant guy. So it's a big cave, not a little cave with a rock in front, but it's a big place with this giant, and it's blocked by this boulder. Now, at first they think, well, let's, let's try to kill him. Let's try to think of a way to kill him. And they ply him with wine. They brought the wine. They give him some wine. He drinks the wine. The guy gets drunk, and he passes out, and they, they debate about, you know, killing him in his sleep. And then they realize, well, if we kill him, we're not going to be able to move that rock. We'll never get out of here. So they're going to be trapped. So Odysseus comes up with this idea, and he gets a... He gets a staff, and he heats it up in a fire, and he jams it into Polyphemus' eye. 
And Polyphemus, is, he wakes up and he's screaming, who's, who's killing me? Who's killing me? Who's killing me? And Odysseus gets this brilliant idea. He says, my name is nobody. And so Polyphemus is screaming that nobody is killing me. Nobody is killing me. So, of course, the other Cyclopeans hear this and they figure, okay, nobody's killing him. No big deal. So they ignore him. I guess uh, <laughs> pretty light material there. I mean, you talk about an easy out, right? Nobody is killing me. Okay, fine. So shut up. So they ignore the guy. Now, Polyphemus comes around and he realizes that he's got to let his goats out because they have to get out to pasture or they won't eat and they'll starve. So he plunks himself down in front of the door and he pushes the rock away and now the goats can get by and he can feel them but if the guys try to get by he'll snatch them up and, and eat them. So Odysseus gets the idea that they should get under the goats on the underside of the goat and hang on and when the goats run out the door they can go out with them. And the plan works. And so Odysseus and his crew all escape with the goats. They run down to their ship. And Polyphemus is not aware that they're out. He's still, you know, he can't see, but he's still trying to hear and feel. And he doesn't know where these guys are. They get in the ship, and Odysseus just can't resist taunting Polyphemus. So he yells up at him, ah, you know, we got away, we're escaping. He yells something at him. And Polyphemus gets big rocks, and he's blind, and he starts dropping them into the bay. And so the ship is being bombarded, and they all miss, and they get out of the bay. And then Odysseus decides to push his luck, and they go back into the bay, and he does it again. He taunts him again, and he says, Ah, oh, you know, we got away, and you can't see us. And he throws more rocks down, and then they, they flee. So that's the Odyssey. That's what happens there, and it's important to keep that stuff in mind because it is shadowed in Ulysses brilliantly. All right, so in Ulysses, this, as I said before, is a pretty complex chapter. It's one of the more difficult. So I, I thought about how can I break this down so that it's graspable, right? So... What I want to do is give you an overview of what happens in the episode so that you've got a chunk that you can compare with the Odyssey, and then let's break it down a little bit. So what, what happens? All right, we have the narrator of this episode is walking down the street, and he runs into Joe Hines, and, you know, they start talking, and they decide that they're going to go to uh, the pub, uh, it's, uh, let me see, Barney Kiernan's. Uh, so they head off to Barney Kiernan's because they, uh, Joe Hines, a lot of characters who keep straight, and I'll probably mess up, so you can tell me in the comments where I mess up. Joe Hines um, has just been to a meeting about the foot and mouth disease for the cattle, and he wants to fill the citizen in on what's going on there, so he wants to head over to Barney Kiernan's. Uh, the narrator is a collection guy, and he's been out trying to collect on a deadbeat account. And we have uh, this guy, uh, Herzog, who sold uh, this other guy some tea and sugar on credit. And the guy hasn't paid his bill, and he's not paying his bill, so our, our narrator has been hired as a collection guy to go collect the money for uh, Mr. Herzog. So you you have that sort of snide stuff about he he drinks my tea and he eats me sugar and he doesn't pay me any monies. You know, we get that stuff in there because the narrator is a collection guy. He's been out trying to collect from this from this deadbeat. And then the deadbeat guy just flat refuses to pay. He doesn't evade. He doesn't say, oh, I'll pay you next week. He tells him to beat it, and he says, you know, if you come around here again, I'm going to report your client for uh, selling without a license. So this guy Herzog has been, I guess, operating without a license, and so this deadbeat is going to report him, and of course everybody is going to be on his side, you know, because they're pretty much anti-Semitic society anyway, and so 
there's very little hope of collecting on this account. At the pub, we we have the citizen who is sort of a arch typical uh, what we today would call a neoconservative. He's like this this nationalist bigot guy, okay? And he's there at the pub. And outside the pub is Bloom. And Bloom is pacing back and forth. And he's waiting for Martin Cunningham. Bloom has uh, realized something about Patty Dignam's insurance policy. And that is that the policy was heavily mortgaged. Remember, we, we talked about that at the uh, Hades episode. The, the in insurance policy was mortgaged. The, the Dignam had borrowed against it. But when you borrow against a policy, you know, if you use it as collateral, you have to notify the insurance company, and the insurance company was never notified. And Bloom says that, you know what, the claim against that policy is probably not valid because the insurance company didn't record it, and they didn't approve that. So Bloom is using his legal knowledge, his just general knowledge, to try to help the Dignam family. So he's there to meet Martin Cunningham. He's pacing back and forth outside, and we see the citizen and the guys inside talk about Bloom, and then finally they tell him to come in, come in, we won't eat you alive. You get it? Okay, so he, te he tells him that, and then Bloom does come in. When Bloom comes in, they try to get him to stand around the drinks. Now this is Every place Bloom goes, they they criticize him for not buying drinks. Now here is a big one. They invite him in, and then well, what do you have? And it's, it's Bloom says nothing for me. He's he's going to this uh, sort of a meeting. He's going to meet with the widow, and he's going to try to do something about this insurance thing. He doesn't want to drink, and then they figure he doesn't want to drink because he's just a tightwad. There are some comments about he's probably off to take advantage of widows and orphans when Bloom is actually there to help widows and orphans, but they, they criticize him as, you know, because he's the Jew, he's out to take advantage of widows and orphans. They also make reference to him being in, uh, in the Masons. At that time, at the turn of the century, the beginning of the 1900s, there was a big conspiracy talk about the Jews being in league with the Masons to control governments and economies and banking and money in, in general. This was a conspiracy that came up again and again and again, and it's a you know, pretty ugly thing, but it was common, so they talk about the Bloom being part of the Masons, and that's part of this conspiracy thing that was all over Europe at that, at that time. So, in the pub, Bloom decides he'll take a cigar. So Bloom has the cigar, and as he talks, he's he's uh, gesturing with this cigar, which you know, if you think about the Cyclops with the flaming stick, and he's poking at the eye of this of the Cyclops. I almost said citizen because it's so close. And we have Bloom with the flaming torch, and he's poking at the citizen, you know, giving it this as he talks. And they talk about the uh, the guy being hung, hanged, I should say, the guy being hanged, and they sort of uh, glorify that uh, situation, the, the martyrdom. Okay, so we have this dialogue about a hanging. The the uh, one of the guys produces some letters uh, that were to the sheriff about a hanging, and then uh, they t talk about the hanged person. Uh, having a erection and then Bloom says well there's a and he's got the cigar and there's a scientific reason for that and when you sever the spine uh, it's a it's a natural phenomenon and so they refer to Bloom as the phenomenologist try saying that on a video and they they mock him uh, for having this kind of know-it-all attitude that he's got an answer for everything. It turns out that what he says is true, and then there's this crazy kind of uh, wordplay on this hanging, where the, you know, the guy is being hung, he turns down his, uh, 
he turns down his last meal. He asks it to be donated. The, the crowd is moved. The, the woman comes up, is, is uh, betrothed. They kiss. And then this other guy says, well, if you're going to hang him, I'll take her. And then the crowd is moved. Everybody's happy. It's like a happy ending. And I'll, I'll explain that in, in a bit. But the main thing is that Bloom does offer an explanation, and then they somewhat mock him about this. So with that in mind as, a, as an overall, and then the dialogue sort of accelerates. It gets a little bit nasty. It gets a lot nasty, actually, at the end. It gets very anti-Semitic and very racist. And uh, and then Bloom can't take any more. He explodes. He runs out, and the guy throws the biscuit tin at him. So that's the overview of what happens in this episode. Now, when you read it, were it that simple, right? It's certainly not. So let's break it down so that you can get some of the finer detail, because this is not only a complex chapter; it's really one of the best, and it's. It should move you, touch you, and it should make you laugh out loud. So when you get it and you understand the humor, I think you'll go back and read this and you'll get the, the humor of it and the jokes. And I'm going to try to open that up for you so that you have a really good understanding and can appreciate when, when people say, oh, I can't stand Joyce. It's all so esoteric and there's so many references. Well, I want to open that up for you right now so that Yes, there are a lot of references, and yes, it is esoteric, but when you get it, it's brilliant, and it's downright funny. It's, it's amusing stuff, so let's try to open this up. Okay, so there's, there's the recap of the Odyssey and the recap of Ulysses. Now, in this chapter, we have three main characters. Okay, of course, we have a lot of other, more people than we can keep track of. Uh, including Bloom. Bloom is in there as well. But the three main characters of this episode are the citizen, the narrator, and then there's this weird injection of, it's like a different style, and these little stories pop up. So there's some dialogue, and then there's this weird few paragraphs of stuff. That is what is... Uh, has been labeled as the Paradist. The Paradist is the third person in this episode. So you have the citizen, the narrator, and the Paradist. Now a Paradist is somebody that makes a parody. All right, so we have the citizen is spouting off this Irish nationalism. He speaks to his dog, this mangy mongrel. He speaks to him in Irish, and he's very uh, nationalistic, and he, he wants to bring back the Irish sport. He supports the Irish literary revival. He believes that even a dog should speak the Irish language. Bloom isn't Irish. He's not certainly not Irish enough. Being a Jew, he's, he's not really Irish. And, you know, the, the citizen is very ethnocentric and, and bigoted. And the narrator is the guy that keeps the story going. He, he brings it all forward as a narrator would. So he says, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then we went here, and then they spoke about this, and then there was a dialogue about that. So the, the narrator keeps it moving. Now, the, the narrator is not a neutral party. He might be called a unreliable narrator by uh, some standards, and as referenced in some literature. He certainly is sympathetic with the citizen. He is not a neutral party. All right. And the third character is the Paradist. Now, what the Paradist does, I think it, this is one of the most fascinating techniques in literature, is that the, the Paradist takes what's going on and he jumps in with a parody of it. All right. So you know what a parody is, like Saturday Night Live commercials, you know, where they, they make a spoof of, of something or a spoof of, of a movie or a TV show or something like that. That's what the Paradist does. Now, in this case, the Paradist takes these references and he, he romanticizes them. He goes to that sentimentality and he goes way, way, way out of proportion, all right? So 
one of the first, there are 33 of these parodies in this chapter. And one of the first is there's a, a reference to Ireland and then the parodist immediately jumps in and he speaks of this land where the, the streams are, I made some notes here so I remember to cover everything, uh, the, the streams are, are just full of fish, the land is populated with, with great warriors and princes, all the women are beautiful and they spend their day uh, playing with, and he, he mentions all these things that they play with, you know, the, the, the seashells and the shiny rocks and even the insects, they, the maidens even play with the insects. So the parodist takes everything vastly out of proportion. He makes a parody of it. If you look for these parody events, they're really laugh out loud funny. Um, one, of the, one of the great parodies we get is the description of the citizen. So the guys go in the bar and the citizen's there and, you know, what do you have? And they order drinks. And then immediately the parodist gives us a description of the citizen. Now you would think it's, a, you know, here's a guy sitting there. He's a, he's a former athlete. In fact, probably based on this old retired shot putter uh, of Ireland. Uh, his name was Michael Cusack. Um, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I, I don't know. That's the theory of that. So he's a big kind of burly guy. He's nationalistic. But then the parodist steps in with his description about he, he wears a long sleeve garment of oxide and a kilt and his feet are shod in, in brogues made of salted calves hide and they're tied up with the uh, esophagus of, a, of an animal. You know, he's, he's this big giant guy he's sitting on a boulder, it says, at the foot of a tower and he's, he's so big and his nostrils are so huge with the red hair coming out that his, his nostrils are so big that birds could nest in there, you know. And so we have this bizarrely exaggerated description of this guy. Now, the parodist gives you a parody of everything they talk about. And it's, they're laugh out loud funny when you, when you recognize that. Now, when you're reading them, it's like, <sighs> You know, you run into a wall. What is this? You know, the, the language shifts. It makes no sense unless you know what they're talking about. And it really can throw you off. And it's, and it's very hard to follow what's happening in this episode. All right. Um, one of them is they talk about this uh, Herzog guy and he sold to this deadbeat. And he said he was out collecting the bill. And then the parodist jumps in with, you know, this mock contract about the, the tea and sugar is sold to this guy and it cannot be assigned until the bill is paid in full and that then it will the contract will go to his heirs and successors for future generations and all this you know it's he makes a parody of everything they say so if you recognize that and you read these things they're actually pretty funny I mean the description of the, the citizen is just laugh out loud funny because he talks about the guy has the medallions of the great heroes of Ireland. And he goes back in history to some ancient histories of Ireland. And then he starts pulling out all these other characters, Ludwig van Beethoven, uh, Beethoven uh, Napoleon. He, he just pulls these people out of the air. Uh, Adam and Eve, you know, they're not heroes of Ireland. But he names off like a hundred things. So this guy is wearing these medallions of the, you know, these medals of the great heroes of Ireland. And we have Beethoven, Adam and Eve, Napoleon. And he names off like 50 characters, right? So it's, it's comical in the exaggeration of things. So if you go back and read these in that light, I think maybe you'll appreciate it a bit more. He, uh, he talks about the forests of Ireland, and then there's the, the forest committee that's um, looking to preserve the trees and plant new trees and protect the trees and that kind of stuff. And then he names off the people on the committee, and there's Lady Birch and, and Lady Pine and the esteemed, you know, and he names off all these people with tree names. It's just, it's comical 
and painful at the same time. Now, Joyce is screaming out to us about sentimentality. In the last episode, and I'll hit this again at the recap at the end, but in the last episode, we hit that very subject about sentimentality, that the sirens was sentimentality. And he cautions us against going to sentimentality. Now, why? Why is that? Why does that matter? Can't we, you know, we hear some music and we think of the glory days of the past. What's wrong with that? Well, we'll hit that again in a, in a second. Now, so you really understand this concept of the paradist. I want to give you something in today's terms that maybe you can go back and relate this to this episode. Okay, so let's let's say that um, here's my little paradis injection. So, uh, did you see Trump's news conference on TV today? No, says I. How's the news? Well, um, better every day. It, things are just getting better every day. Now, at that point, the paradis jumps in. At precisely 12 noon, the esteemed Donald Trump stepped slowly down the golden staircase from the upper rooms of the glamorous White House to pronounce wisdom on members of the press. Mr. Trump was the picture of leadership perfection with his perfectly formed golden hair, not a hair out of place. That combined with his huge comforting hands made for the image of a perfect leader. He was accompanied by his beautiful wife, who was adorned in the finest costume made by the world's finest designers. Before the august Mr. Trump spoke, the press was entertained by an exhibition of juggling by the president's favorite daughter, Lady Irelia Vanka Trump. There wasn't a dry eye in the place when she concluded juggling and closed with praise for her father, her dear, dear father. Mr. Trump then announced that America would soon be great again. As he was eliminating taxes for all wealthy Americans, the room bursts into applause because now every wealthy American will have more money to distribute to the poor and needy of the country. Now, you get the idea. It's sarcastic, and Joyce makes it funny so that it's not biting. But it is biting. And what I just did is biting, but hopefully a little funny. I mean, if you can picture, you know, Trump having a press conference and descending down the down the golden scare, staircase to the press, and then um, Ivanka juggling to warm him up. You know, that's what Joyce is doing. He's giving us a parody of the event, but there's a bite in it, that part at the end about eliminating taxes for the wealthy so that they would have even more money to give away, which we know is nonsense, but that's romanticizing this stupidity, and that's what Joyce is cautioning cautioning us against. That's what the paradis role is in this episode. When these guys go to these sentimentality uh, expressions and episodes, the, the paradis steps in and, and gives us a parody of what they're talking about. There are 33 of them. Okay, so I would encourage you to go back and look at the episode and look for those parodies and really understand where they start and end. You can see them visually in the, the way the book is laid out. They're, they're chunked paragraphs without dialogue, so they're easier to identify. But when you don't understand what's going on, they throw you off. So go back and look for these parodies. Again, there are 33, so they're all throughout the chapter and see what he's trying to say and get a kick out of the humor that he injects and what he's trying to tell us. Now, let's come to the to the point. There is an awful lot of anti-Semitic, nasty 
stuff throughout the episode. They pick at Bloom. And by the end, um, Bloom's about had enough. He stands up to the myopic citizen. Okay? Now, the guy's a giant. You know, all these guys have come here to see the citizen. So he is a giant in the society, in that sense. And Bloom is standing up to this guy. And with the cigar, he's poking him in the eye. And the citizen says, there is none so blind as he who will not see. And there, there are a lot of little references throughout that should give you a little chuckle that tie us back to the, to the Odyssey. But then the citizen accuses Bloom of, of course, taking advantage of the poor and of not being really Irish. And, and Bloom just has had enough. He, he finally pops. And he says that he's, I'm Irish. My, my nation is Ireland. That's, that's where I'm from. And, and the citizen poo-poo's that. And, and Bloom explodes. And he tells him that Bloom rails against this hatred. And, and he says that he, he stands for love. And they mock, oh, love, love. And they, they mock that. And then Bloom really uncorks. And then he blows and he says, your, your savior was a Jew and his father was a Jew. And your, your God, and, and Martin Cunningham corrects him and he says, he had no father. Now that's, that's enough. Cunningham tries to just, let's just settle down and get out of here. And, and Bloom is, is seething and the citizen says, who's God? Who's God? Well, his, his uncle was a Jew. Your God was a Jew. Christ was a Jew, like me. And the, and the citizen now is angry, and he's looking for something to throw, and he gets the biscuit tin, and he winds up, and Bloom's running down the street. They're headed for the car to go see the Dignam widow, and the citizen throws the biscuit tin, and he misses. And that's pretty much it except for this line and the and the citizen says by jesus i'll crucify him now there's an irony there you know that bloom is becoming a a bit of a christ figure here he stands for love he's he reminds these people what their own religion teaches them and what their own savior is all about and they resent it and they, they argue with him and that he's a Jew and he's no good and he's out to take advantage of widows and and Bloom stands up. Now, Bloom doesn't get it all right. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, your your savior was a Jew. That's okay. His father was a Jew. Well, I, I don't know. His uncle was a Jew. <laughs> you know, it gets a little, it gets a little out of hand because that's what anger does. Now, Joyce, I've said this before, he doesn't make mistakes, so when you see stuff like this, he's he's putting it there for a reason. His uncle was a Jew. His uncle? You know, it, it's just Bloom doesn't have all the theology right. He doesn't know how all this Trinity stuff and Catholicism works, but he, he knows a bit of it, all right? And he knows enough to get himself in trouble, and especially when he's angry. So he spouts some stuff. He probably goes too far. But the core of his point is is right. So that's that. Now, I, I want you to read this chapter again. Go back and look at it. Don't just take this explanation and say, okay, now I, now I understand and go on. Go back and reread it so you can really appreciate it. It's dense, but it's one of the most brilliant, touching, amusing, thought-provoking and original chapters in the book. One of the most difficult, but one of the, far and away one of the most interesting. Now, let's go back to this thing about sentimentality. In Sirens, I said that the, the danger was not the women, it was sentimentality. Joyce is wrapping up that thesis in this chapter. He's telling us that this, this romancing of the past is not good. It, it's not just 
fondly remembering your history. Within this sentimentality of looking back at the past and the good old days, and as Trump would say, you know, make America great again, and people say, well, you know, what, is that, what does that mean? Are we talking about, like, let's go back to the 50s, you know, where it's, the black people in this country, it's, many of them couldn't vote in southern states, or do we go back prior to that where we had slavery? Or do we go back prior to that where we were massacring the, the native population? Or do we go back prior to that where the, the nations were fighting over, you know, rights to uh, take beavers and destroy the, the wildlife and, and find gold and, you know, where exactly are these good old days? And what Bloom is telling us is that within this sentimentality is there is a veil of racism and bigotry and hatred. Your, your view backwards is distorted. And Bloom says, look forward to a better society. Don't look back to the good old days. Now, we've talked about this Irish literary revival that he opposes. Don't go back to this old dead language that nobody speaks and nobody can understand. Don't go back to that nonsense. Because that going back, it doesn't lead to a renaissance of new stuff. It leads to this nonsense that the citizen is spouting. Now think about this. Joyce is way ahead of his time. He's 15 years ahead of Hitler. Now, when you know, after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles and German economy is broken, along comes Hitler and he tells him what, you know, Irish language, Irish, uh, Irish, German language, German music, German history, German nationalism, German race, it goes there, okay? This sentimentality has a dangerous thread in it in that it leads to this nationalistic, bigotry and and hatred and that's why he opposes the sentimentality of looking back to the past we don't have an accurate picture of it we're not taught an accurate picture of it and when we look back over time we tend to romanticize it like the description of the hanging where the paradise that, that, that makes this happy scene that the guy's uh, he's in high spirits the guy who's about to be flung into eternity and the girl gets a proposal right there, and so she's happy, and she accepts the proposal. The crowd's happy. They, the uh, guy comes from the dog pound, and he's going to get the blood and guts from the guy that's being hanged. And so that he's happy. Everybody's happy. It's a big happy event. It's a beautiful day, sunny, nice breeze, you know. And and they romanticize the hanging of this uh, martyr. And that's what we do when we look back. So when Joyce tells us to not go to this sentimentality, that's what he's talking about. And those are the sirens of the previous episode where they sang all these nationalistic songs. There's a danger in that stuff that we can fall into this nationalistic nonsense. Now, frankly, and this will probably alienate some people, but I want to say it anyway. Look at the United States today. Look at what we're doing. You know, when we when we push to make America great again, instead of let's make things better than they are today and look forward, if we say make it great again, that implies make it like it was, what do we get? We get this anti-immigration, anti-immigrant. So we turn, not only do we want to stop immigration, but we want to get rid of the people that are here. And then... Who's American enough? You know, who's the, the, of the ones that are here? So at the first, we, we don't want more immigrants. Then we don't want illegal immigrants. Now, of the legal ones, you know, there's some of those we don't want. You know, so that's where this goes. And that's what Joyce is telling us here over 100 years ago. Don't go there. I think it's beautiful stuff. I really think it's beautiful stuff. I mean, it's... I'm almost overwhelmed to express this. It's, it's, it's really incredible stuff. Now, go back and read this chapter slowly and see if you can catch that and understand and, and feel it 
what he's telling us is worth it. It's one of the finest chapters in all of literature. So I hope you enjoyed this. I'm sorry it's a little bit choppy. I got a couple of phone calls in there and I had to break and cut. But you get the main point and I really think it's incredible. So thank you. I appreciate your support. I would love your comments. I'd love to have some more dialogue on this subject and this chapter. Uh, subscribe, leave me a comment down below, and thank you so much. I appreciate you watching. Slancha. Until next time.